Okay, welcome to Office Hours, everybody. This week we're going to talk about random number generators and some like special concerns that they have in the context of procedurally generated content. Uh, at first try, swish. Um, so a lot of things in video games, particularly cosmetic things, will use uh, RNG. Um, people... There's kind of tech people who want to be technical will say pseudo random number generators because the numbers aren't actually random. Um, and actually, for games, you wouldn't want the numbers to be random for something that affects gameplay. Uh, the reason being is that you don't want like actual entropy in a system where you might want to reproduce bugs, for example. Um, you would like things to be reproducible. Um, down to the most granular level possible for a game that you're making. That way, if anything weird ever happens, or if you ever get any sort of bug report, um, you'll be able to reproduce the conditions that it happened under, um, instead of just wanging it and playtesting a bunch and just hoping that you catch things as they appear. Um, so, uh, a good example... Uh, it's not an audiobook. I will have some stuff to show. It's stuff you've already seen, Chris. Um, so I suppose it would be something interesting besides just an empty level. But here we're in a little cave, a little tile-based cave, uh, with some grass and a puddle and some stalactites and a pedestal with a dagger on it. Uh, nothing incredibly interesting in here. Um, but this cave has been generated and... If we go and stop the game, the cave will disappear, and if we restart the game, the cave will reappear exactly the same as it was before, um, because all of this stuff is generated in a reproducible way. So, like, if you've ever played Binding of Isaac, or if you've ever played Minecraft, um, those games are very explicit <laughs> about the fact that there's a seed for the random number generator that kind of guides the level generation. And both of those games will allow you to input a seed as a means of reproducing the same world with the same stuff in it. Um, so there's kind of some interesting caveats um, to making something like this work. Uh, so in JavaScript, uh, and by extension in TypeScript, uh, do we have just like an unused thing that I could just type in? Sure we do. No idea who this belongs to. Um, but so we have a little script here, and so the normal way that you would actually, hang on, uh, let's just make a new script and I'll end up using it later for something. Office hours. If I could type, that would be excellent. Is the text large enough for people to see, by the way? Because that could be an issue. I'm going to assume that it's fine. Wait, there's no screenshot. Oh my god. I'm so sorry. I'm a genius today. I set it up in uh, OBS, but not... Wow, okay. Smooth. Sorry, I was uh, I was assuming that the other guys had you on Twitch or somewhere else for the video. Because that... Yeah, otherwise I would have mentioned it. I'm just peak genius today, that's all. <laughs> oh, it's Friday. It's Friday, Monday. Um, so is the text large enough? I'll take it by. It's okay for me, but I, I'm not going to be fully watching the video. Yeah, anyway, I, so I would expect better. not. I'm just for people who watch it later. Text is large enough. Okay, cool. A penny out of ten. Yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, the stand so most programming languages have some kind of mechanism to get pseudo random numbers built in. In JS, we have math.random. And what math.random does is it gives us a float between 0 and 1. Uh, 0 inclusive, 1 not inclusive, so this. There you go. It'll give us a float between 0 and 1. And if I go and run the game. Actually, you know what? Let's have some spam. I'll put this in tick. There you go. So there are some bloats between 0 and 1. 
and this is valuable um, for some things but not for others. So in a lot of our games we do use this for things that affect gameplay, um, which is maybe not always desirable, but for the kind of scale of games that we're currently making it's generally not a big deal. Um, and also, since it's just a range between 0 and 1, we usually will take this number and do something else with it um, that kind of keeps it in some sane, like, relatively reproducible thing. Like, if you're mapping this on to making a choice from an array, like, oh, there are 10 things and I want to pick one at random, so what I'll do is I'll say math floor to round down, and then I'll do math random and I have 10 things, so I'll multiply that by 10. Since this will always be less than one, it will never actually be 10. It'll always round down to at the most nine. So if we do that, then we'll get a random choice from zero up through nine, right? Um, so you could use that to make like a choice out of an array or whatever. Um, but particularly in procedural generation, you really want something reproducible because making a level generator is hard. Um, making a good level generator is particularly hard and you can get into weird edge cases where things don't behave the way you expect and so you really want to be able to reproduce a given behavior. JavaScript does not have a built-in way to do that. Um, if you are using C um, I would strongly recommend against using RAND, which is the random number function built into the C standard library, because it's really crap. Um, but if you were to use it, um, you can at least provide it a seed. But uh, the way that random number streams behave, including math.random that we have in JavaScript, is each successive number has been computed from the previous number. So what that means is there's no random access to a random number. Each random number is part of a sequence, and you can't get it out of that sequence. So even if we could set a seed for math.random, that wouldn't really help us, per se, for doing some kind of reproducible like level generation, because um, we would still have to go through... So like let's say we were going to generate a grid of tiles, and that it was a 10 by 10 map, so we have 100 tiles. And let's say that we used math.random to choose what starting value the tile should have for our level generator. Well, then that means if we want to know what the 100th tile's value is, we have to call math.random 99 times, <laughs> right? So let's say that we are loading a save file and we know where our player is. We might not need some of the tiles in the in the game, but we need to like go through the whole sequence to get to where they presently are and have the same results, right? To like reproduce the same level that they were in when they were playing last time, we have to go through all these steps and that really sucks. Um, so what you want is you want a way to decouple, um, you want to get some random numbers in a particular scenario that are decoupled from previous steps in the generation process. Um, so like in here, as I'm walking along, these tiles and all of their accoutrements like the grass and the, the stalactites are spawning in just outside the fog and then they're being deleted when I walk away. And whether or not grass or stalactites should be there is being computed when the tile spawns in. So it's independent of me generating the whole map. Um, that's not an obligatory thing. There's kind of a spectrum here. I should have set up my Wacom tablet to draw a diagram, but I didn't. Um, but um, <laughs> thanks, Chris. Yeah, me and, me and a friend are working on it. It's pretty cool, right? But um, I have infinite swords. But um, it's kind of the, the deal with a random number sequence is just you want to limit the sequence dependence to whatever chunk makes sense for your game. So in this case, I spawn in one tile at a time. So whenever I'm spawning in a tile, that tile will use a random number sequence for everything in that tile, right? So that means um, if 
a pedestal is spawning, and then if that pedestal is spawning an item, those both depend, and then if there's also a stalactite, all of those probabilities depend on one number sequence um, whose seed has something to do with this tile, right? And the reason that a sequence is fine here is because I only need... Um, is I, I can have a sequence because the same things will always happen on this tile. Like, I will never skip one of the steps on this single tile. There will always be the same steps there. So it's fine that it's in a sequence, right? Because I'll always go through the sequence. Um, however, like, when I'm uh, having the whole map, that's not the case, right? Because I'm doing this tile by tile as I walk around to keep the entity count low. Um, so it would be a problem if the stalagmite on this tile over here, the stalactite rather, if this stalactite depended on the same number sequence as this stalactite, then I would have to go through every single tile in the map to generate this tile, even if I didn't need the tiles over there. Um, so how do we get a system like that is the question, and it's kind of tricky and requires some indirection to work. So you might think, well, assuming we have an RNG that we concede, then it's really easy, right? Uh, so here's one that I borrowed from GitHub, which is MIT licensed. It's called PRando, or Prondo, maybe. I don't know. Um, but it allows you to uh, it allows you to give it a seed on which the subsequent stream of random numbers will be based, which is useful. That's what we need. Um, and uh, other languages have random number generators that already take a seed, um, just not JavaScript. Um, but anyway, so the most naive thing would be well, okay, for each tile. I'll make a new random number generator, a new prando, and for the seed, I'll just give it the tile coordinates, right? Because the tile coordinates will never change for that tile, so it should be stable, right? Given the same tile coordinates, I should get the same stream of random numbers. And that's true, however, I really should have made an example for this. See, rand is extra bad, so it would have been a good example. Anyway, um... The problem is the tile coordinates are correlated with each other, right? Like strongly correlated. If this tile is like one, two, then this tile is one, three, right? And that's a problem because if you're doing a random number generator with just like a numeric seed, if your seeds are strongly correlated, then the random number streams will also be correlated. Um, and it's not necessarily that each random number is correlated with every other random number, but there will basically be, there's, most random number generators are periodic at some scale. And if you have highly correlated seeds, you will have highly correlated values at some offset. So if you were to take um, like a crappy random function that's seedable and you were to feed in a sequence of seeds which are um, highly correlated, like this row of tiles coordinates, for example, you would end up basically generating these diagonal lines of high values or low values. There would be very obvious patterns in the random numbers that you got, because any one sequence would seem pretty random, but when you put them next to each other, they would be highly correlated. Um, so that's a problem. So what we would like to do is we would like to take something stable and consistent, like the tile coordinate, and we would like to turn it into a different seed which is not correlated with the tile coordinates or the other tile coordinates, if that makes sense. So like we would like to take a tile coordinate like 1, 3 and turn it into some crazy hash or something so that it wouldn't be correlated with the other tiles anymore, so that each individual tile would seem sufficiently random from the other tiles in terms of what values we got. Uh, so that's what we did, and we did it in a not amazing way. So there are loads of libraries out there for generating random hashes. Um, some of them are really fast, some of them are really good, some of them have cryptographic level strength, some of them don't. 
MD5 is kind of a classic, not very good hash, um, but it's good enough for specific cases, right? Um, so, uh, what I did is incredibly goofy. Uh, where's my little function? So this <laughs> is a rewritten function from the dot big bang engine. I did not get a hashing library. Um, this is the function that generates, I believe, all of our entity IDs and maybe some resource IDs, not sure, but definitely the entity IDs. And it just, it takes a random number generator function for a number stream. And then uh, if you don't supply one, it defaults to math random. And then it will just create this large string by generating some random numbers with the generator and then stringifying them. And so that, for example, here's the game manager's GUID. We are generating strings like this. And so this is a little bit expensive given all the string munging, but it's fine. Um, in practice, you're only ever going to be creating so many tiles per frame, usually on the order of like maybe four or five, um, which isn't bad at all to generate four or five hashes in a frame. But so how that works is, so as a quick summary, so for each, given tile, we take information about that tile, which in this case is um, what quote unquote floor the tile is on. And then, well, I'll just show you that actually. So currently this little cave, which is exactly the same every time, there's a root seed for this called uh, Bingo Bongo is the seed that I'm giving. And then P Rando does like a naive hash of this um, which is just like a checksum, and then uses that to create a numeric seed that we're using to generate everything else. Um, but we're not using one stream, we're like using one stream to generate other streams, if that makes sense, so that we can have the independence between tiles and be able to generate any tile arbitrarily, that sort of thing. So we take our seed bingo bongo, we use that as a seed for one RNG stream. Then for each floor of the dungeon, of which we only have one right now, which is the cave, uh, we go and we generate a new seed for that floor based on just the sequence um, from this base RNG. And so then we create a new stream of numbers for each floor based on the floor's seed, if that makes sense. So what that looks like in practice uh, is so when we start uh, the game, we go and generate a base map, which is we go through, um, we use simplex noise, which is kind of like Perlin noise, um, except it tends to look a little bit nicer. Doesn't really matter. Anyway, we use some simplex noise to fill in um, the tiles, and we use the floors like base RNG for that. We do some game of life cellular automata stuff to make quote unquote caves, right? Uh, and then, and this, that produces like a table of booleans. And so then we make the actual tile data where we go through and generate tiles based on the game of life stuff. And then we do a height map, which is just the floor is uneven to add some interest. This is just me using simplex noise to get a continuous gradient of like slopes and hills and valleys for the floor, nothing too fancy. Um, but all of this generation is based on that floor RNG. So once we've done that, uh, whenever the player is trotting around, what we do is we figure out where the player is. So we go and we get the game's render distance for the fog and that gives us a radius around the player where we should spawn tiles. So we go ahead and convert that into how many tiles we need to go through. So then we can get this rectangle around the player where there should be tiles, right? And then basically what we do um, is we go through all of our existing tile entities. And if we find ones that are outside that rectangle, we mark them to be deleted on the next frame. And we also create this table called extant, 
which is just a dictionary of which tiles are, are filled currently. And so if we go through the rectangle and there are any missing tiles that should be extant, we call this spawn world cell function, which takes the X and Z of the tile. So spawn world cell then is going to use all the RNG stuff I was talking about. So we get the actual value of the tile, whether it's a floor or a wall, um, from the map we computed at the start. So we just have this like 2D table of numbers, which is pretty cheap. Um, so we go and grab what the tile is, uh, and then we go and check if we have a template to spawn. So in the case of a wall, we just spawn this template of a wall, and then we're done, right? Uh, if we are spawning a floor, then some more stuff happens, right? So we go and we spawn the tile entity, right? And then we offset it by the height um, from that height map just to add some interest. So then if uh, this zero means floor, in this case, one means wall, super simple tile map. So if the tile is open, if it's a floor, then we have our really crappy ceiling, which is we spawn another copy of the floor entity, and then we just move it up <laughs> by a certain height. Uh, incredibly lazy. For the generative parts, this is where it's interesting. So we get the seed for the floor that we use to generate the map, right? But then we create a new random number stream. And this is just some goofiness that I've done. So I take the X coordinate of the tile, I shift it to the left 16 bits. I add uh, the Z. Um, so basically I've taken the, the high word is now the X and the low word is the Z. None of that matters. You could probably combine these in any way you want. The important thing is just that every tile has a unique number assigned to it that is always the same. So like if I did X plus Z, that would be a problem because then um, there would be some symmetry to the level. Um, because there are X and Z values that are complementary, right? That would, you know, if X is three and Z is six, well, that's gonna give me the same RNG as if X was six and Z was three. So doing this is just a lazy way to make sure that every tile has a unique number here. Um, I'm converting that to a string and then I'm concatenating it to the floor seed, which is another string. Um, and that's just so I can get a unique stream of numbers for each given uh, tile. Uh, and then, I do this a lot of places. It's just a gross, um, a lot of times, if you just want a random function, this is just a little lambda function to just grab the next number from the stream. So that makes it equivalent to calling math random, right? It lets you treat it the same way. Uh, and then, so we get our little RNG specific to this tile. Uh, and then we have uh, I didn't get as much done on this as I would like. We have what are called doodads, um, which is basically for any given uh, tile, there are a series of doodads that we check for eligibility, and then we check if we want to spawn one. Um, so basically we have a script called ddoodad. We get a list of them. Uh, I had to make a hacky function for this. So we get a list of every doodad script on the generator entity, and then we just go through each one and we do this attempt placement. Um, and then we just pass, we're passing in like some utility functions, our tile data, um, and then some other stuff that we need. And then we've got the coordinates and we've got the, the tile entity here is going to be this floor tile. And then we're also passing in the ceiling entity if there is one, which there always will be in this case since there are no outdoor areas or whatever. And then we're passing in this function to get the next random number from our stream. Uh, so if we go and look, there are several doodad scripts over here. There are three of them and I'll open these. So each one of these represents a placement rule for one thing that can appear. So, oh man, this is going to be annoying to try to illustrate. Uh, let me see if I can like, uh, okay, sure. So we have the first one, which is this grass, right? So what I say is you supply some templates for variations of the thing. Um, and then you have 
there's a placement style, which can be one of several things. There's grass, center, and random. Um, grass just means we're spawning two variations offset diagonally from each other, um, just because I think it looks nice. And then there's center, where it just drops one. It will pick a template at random and drop it in the middle of the tile. And then there's random, where it will spawn the thing somewhere on the tile um, consistently because of the reproducibleness, right? Then we've got condition tile, which is what tile we are checking for in our surroundings, condition threshold, and then we've got the chance is the actual percent chance of spawning the thing if it's eligible. So like all of these other cond things are determining eligibility basically. So in plain English, what this stuff means is, okay, we're going to see if we have greater than or equal than one neighboring tile, which is a wall, which is one. If we had enumeration properties, this would be a little bit <laughs> easier to read. And we're checking if we have at least one wall as a neighbor, then there's a 35% chance that we will spawn some grass on the floor, right? Um, and this count matches down here. This is basically which sort of rule. This is going to be sh this is going to be a short one. Listen, it is a short one. I I didn't write an outline. I didn't get any nice slides together. I'm a mess. Penny, this is going to be a short one, Quinn three hours later. Um, but so these rules, this is kind of abstract, but it lets you place things based on conditions, right? So that's the, how the grass gets placed, um, is it's placed near walls 35% of the time, basically. Uh, then we have the test pedestal, which is not visible. There we go. We have the test, oh crap, go back. There we go. We have the test pedestal, which has a 13% chance of spawning on the floor when there are at least when there are eight tile net that's incorrect that shouldn't actually be there what oh never mind it should well no it shouldn't there's some goofery somewhere in arithmetic probably uh the pedestal in theory should only spawn in places where there are eight floor tiles surrounding it although no yeah that just doesn't make sense Okay, good to know. There's a bug someplace. Anywho, um, and then there are the stalactites, or the third doodad that are in here, which is just, we have two variations of it. Um, it has, my mouse is behaving oddly. It's like, the tracking speed is like changing inconsistently. What the heck? That's crazy. I don't know. Anyway, there are two variations. Uh, one is a little bit darker and horizontally flipped because <clears throat> I'm lazy. Uh, they are placed randomly within the tile. Um, just any floor tiles, basically, if there's more than one floor tile neighbor. So basically any floor tile, they can be placed just about. Um, and they are placed on the ceiling, and they are placed randomly on the ceiling. Uh, so... And we'll look at the doodad script so I can show you how the RNG shakes out. So what the heck is going on with my mouse? It's like inconsistent. Like I'm moving perfectly horizontally and it's moving vertically. I'm just going to whack it. And we're back to normal. Percussive maintenance always works, except on living things. Okay, cool. Where the heck was I? Uh, in the script. Duh, 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 duh. Where is it? Where is it? Okay, so for each doodad, we pass in the random number stream for this tile, right? Um, so now, note that what this means is, if you change the number, if you removed a doodad script off here, it would change all of the following ones because they would be getting different numbers from the stream. But I think that's fine. 
trying to isolate each doodad further would require making another number stream. Like this is all up to you as a developer. I'm fine with screwing up my generation if I change the order of doodads or remove a doodad from the middle of the list. I'm fine with that. Um, but you may want something a little bit, I don't know, a little bit more change immune, I suppose. Um, but anyway, so for an individual doodad, this attempt placement function is where the magic happens. Uh, it's most of the script, in fact. <laughs> so, um, so attempt placement. So first, we get a random number from that stream for the tile, right? We check if we're if we didn't meet the chance requirement percentage, we'll just bail out. Um, if we did, then for each of the different uh, conditions. We have to go grab the corresponding value of like tile neighbors. Uh, and then um, to see if we met the condition, we have to go see which one it is, of which there are many different operations, right? And we'll go and check them. Uh, I might have a duplicate in here or something, but I don't know. Uh, so then if we haven't met our condition, we also bail out. Then we grab all of our variation templates. Um, and then we go and we place the things appropriately. I separated these out into functions because it's very verbose. So place grass floor, we'll just, we get the center of the tile and then we go and we grab um, if the template is there for each uh, of the grass variations, we place them diagonally from each other about the center of the tile. Uh, the random one is a bit different because of course it has to have the random function passed in, right? Um, now you could just use math random for this if the placement of the doodads never affects gameplay. However, I think it's noticeable enough. Like, let's say that you generate once and let's say that this stalactite is here and then say you like leave the game and come back and it's moved over to the left or something. Somebody could notice that and that would kind of break the reality of the game world a lot if they noticed, at least I feel like it would. Um, it's kind of like if you have an open world game with beautiful fields of grass and the grass is placed in different places every time you play, it kind of kills the magic a little bit, at least in my opinion. Um, so like you could use math random for this kind of cosmetic stuff, but I didn't in this case because I think it would be noticeable. Um, and it might change somebody's like if they have a mental map of the space, and it's different when they come back, it will feel broken to them. Um, anyway, so that's just design grumpiness, I guess. Uh, but, so that's kind of how this all fits together. Um, and then this is something kind of goofy that I would probably need to change building this out later on into a full game. Um, so the pedestal has a script on it called loot. And the way this currently works is it stores uh, four different item templates um, to spawn, and then it has uh, weight. It has probabilistic weights for them. I we've got to do something about the properties being in whatever order they were serialized because they load back in in stupid orders that don't. I'm like so picky. I like lay them out in an order, and they're never in that order when I return. Anyway, it's do it doesn't really matter but sometimes it trips me up when I'm like trying to edit something. Anywho's, uh, so you have these weights. Um, there's not a way to make properties that kind of respond to each other's value changes, and that would be really weird to try to add in a way that didn't suck. Um, so all I do is I just sum up the probabilities, and if it's not equal to one, I put a warning in the console. Um, but anyway, so you just, you can set up to four items, you can set a likelihood of that item spawning, uh, and then there's this d init function. And so the way this works is in the doodad script, uh, whenever we spawn a doodad, we send it this event d init, um, which is just kind of a secondary start function. Um, so I can go in here and do whatever extra in it needs to happen specific to this game, right? So whenever a doodad is spawned, um, it will get the random function passed in from that tile, and then you can do stuff with it. So what I do is I go through the items and their weights. 
Um, I choose an item to spawn. If that template is actually set, then I will spawn that item. Um, and it's as simple as that. So what that means is every time I generate the dungeon, not only are these in the same spot and the grass is in the same spot and the tiles are all the same tiles, but I also get the same pedestal with the same spawned item on it, even though it could spawn other items with a different seed. Um, so that all works as intended. Yippee. Um, what else? Oh, conversely, um, there are situations where you don't care about consistency because it's purely cosmetic and doesn't affect gameplay, and maybe it's not so noticeable. So for example, the drips. So the little stalactites have little water drips on them, um, and they just have little drips at different rates, and la-di-da. I don't use the game's reproducible RNG for this because you're not going to notice like the the droplets falling are not a persistent thing they're like transient and they're just kind of part of the sea of stuff that's happening you're not going to notice probably redundancies in the water droplets or things like that so I just use math.random for these um, and I do something kind of hacky which maybe somebody will find useful so these just have like a particle system on them, right? Um, where I tried to make a particle system that kind of works like drops. Don't know why there haven't been any drops yet. Um, but anyway, I've also added this silly script and what the silly script does. So given how the particles work, um, they actually use seemingly a reproducible <laughs> RNG stream. Um, so if you have 50 copies of the stalactite, uh, it will actually drop the same particles in the same pattern as all the other stalactites. And there's nothing um, built in, intrinsic to the engine, that you can do about that, um, except cheating, which is what I've done. So I grab the particle system, and I just offset its internal timer um, to be some random portion of the length of the particle's lifetime. So like the particle max lifetime is something like, I don't remember if it's eight seconds or a hundred seconds or what is it? It's a hundred seconds and it can vary up to 67%. Um, so all I'm doing is offsetting the timer on each stalactite's particle system by up to like 99.999999 seconds. And having done that, they drip at differing rates, but that RNG is like, not reproducible, not stable, it's just math.random, and it's like, fine. Um, so that's all well and good. So like places where math.random makes sense is for stuff that you don't care if it's one off, you don't care if it's one in a million, um, you don't need to reproduce the same exact stream of values, etc. But for level generation, you really want to have something reproducible um, because it will make your life as a developer a lot easier, and it also lets you do things like, for a saved game in this game, I'm not going to have to save every tile value, for example. I can just go and save the seed, which in this case is Bingo Bongo, and because I have the seed Bingo Bongo, I can then reconstruct this cave with just that, right? And then in a release version of a game like this, the seed would be itself random, right? So it's different every time you play through the game and your save data has whatever seed you happen to get, um, et cetera. So, and so it's useful to be like, oh, I had a level generate weird and there's this thing in a place that it shouldn't be. I'll go and print out the seed and then I can just play with that seed over and over until I fix the bug, et cetera. Like it's, it's helpful to have that sort of thing available to you. Um, and it, it does kind of depend on the sort of game you're making as well. So like in Minecraft, um, things are reproducible because you have to be able to share seeds um, for that game. It's just like a feature they want or whatever, but it doesn't have to be the case. Like you could generate a world because the way that Minecraft works is they generate the world once and then they save it, right? <laughs> they save it to disk. So if you're saving the whole world to disk, 
then reproducibility is a choice on the developer's part for other reasons, right? Um, but in this case, we don't want to have to save the entire world. What's the point if we can just reproduce it all, right? Um, Minecraft is a game about changing the world you've generated, um, whereas most dungeon games, like I'm not going to be mining through the wall, but I might be picking up items and killing enemies, so that stuff can get saved. But the tiles values themselves don't need to be, so I can just save the seed, etc. Um, anyway, I have rambled for a long time um, disorganizedly. Does anybody have any like questions or anything else that they would like to talk about? And if not, that's fine. I can go make a cup of coffee. I would ask a question, uh, but I've been trying to fix Escape the Aliens at the same time. <laughs> um, we should definitely fix the fact that particle systems can't be offset. We should let people assign an offset and also uh, just have a tick box for a random one as well because uh, both these things are useful. But it's quite handy for particle systems for them to be reproducible in that way. Yeah, so it is. Also because they're running on the GPU, so uh, if you don't have them operate in a stateless way... No, yeah, uh, for you sure. You need to maintain the state on the CPU. That's kind of like... No, yeah, I, I get why it is why. that way. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't complaining. I was, I, I was just pleasantly no, surprised. You, you should be complaining. Because I, it is annoying well, because uh, you can't, you don't have no control over it. Well, I mean, it'll be easy to add the checkbox, right? But also, oh, like, yeah. I, I, I knew they were stateless, but I didn't realize that it was also like a totally like, um, that it was like a predetermined sequence of numbers. Like that actually made me happy. <laughs> but yeah, I had just, it, it had never been a problem. How that works, actually. I think yeah. it must use a lookup texture, maybe. To, yeah, to that would that. be neat. No. Yeah, maybe it's just got a noise texture that it uses or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I had never, um, I had never spawned like fifty things with the same particle system, so I had never noticed before, yeah. right? Yeah, it's, like it's interesting. Like, is it? I guess it's totally. I mean, it's super useful, particularly for VFX as well, for it to be deterministic because, like, if you've got the teleport effect and there's a bunch of like randomness in that right it could be uh, expensive then... for one thing well, well not yeah expensive but also it could just like look super weird that's true too if you, yeah. <laughs> if you have like if you have it so that like it come you've, you've designed it so it comes out and it's nice and evenly distributed and then like one time in a hundred it's all on one side all, or something like, clumped in <laughs> yeah. the corner yeah <laughs> then that would be annoying so uh so having it be reproducible is like very I, for the same reasons it's useful in in this kind of like level generation as well is because you you actually want to you you want to intentionally design something and when you're doing something that's procedurally generated uh to actually be able to know that you're intentionally designing it you need a rest break penny <laughs> Uh, oh, can it, you get? Does that show up for you guys? It doesn't show up yeah, on yeah. OBS, which is funny. It just shows up yeah. here, which is amazing. How do I? Yeah. Skip. Yeah. There so when go. you <laughs> when you want to design something, you need to be able to see that you your design is actually working as intended. And right. as you said, like all the way through this, the only way of doing that is to be able to make uh, make the thing that you're procedurally generating. Uh, work in a deterministic way so you can reproduce what you've what I've actually you've I've place. actually never changed the seed. Ha, is it is it actually reproducibly Ah oh, well that's a good seed as well. <laughs> yeah well How, currently uh, Oh cool. Shield. Two shields. <laughs> currently there are no um guarantees about the caves that spawn so you could wow there's tons of items in here. <laughs> you could conceivably get a cave um where you're just like in a tiny one tile gap because it doesn't do any like connectivity checks or anything. But it's also an awesome demonstration of uh, how hash functions can generate very, very yeah, far for apart, sure. uh, things with a small change. Absolutely. Yeah. Just give me... What's that in there in the distance? Oh, that's uh, hang on, I can show. Well, 
Is that just something like that isn't being hidden because it's not occluded? Yeah, it's like not occluded by the tiles. It's like the this little testing area with the like. Hang on, I can turn off the like level generation stuff. I should just dump me out here. But there's uh, these like fake enemies that I made with one of John's yeah, cool things. That looks awesome. I love the emissive uh, flash. Wall up them. There used to be particles there, which have now disappeared. No idea why. Anyway. <laughs> Just super goofy. Oh, their FX is just gone. Mm. Mm. I think I stole one of John's zombie effects anyways. Maybe uh, that's why it's gone. Did he did maybe deleted or something? Perhaps. I want to deploy hurry up, I want to deploy to production. Fix all the things. There we go. It's something. Nice. But anyway, yeah, so just because the particles aren't like, don't have fog applied to them, uh, at least I think that's the reason, you can just see them off in the distance if there are like tiles that aren't spawned. Oh, that's funny. Um, I'm not we sure. Put, uh, hmm. Both those in as, we should put the, the fog, lack of fog in as a bug, but also uh, Ben says to put in the task about the offset and making it randomized on uh, him and he might implement it for us. Ooh. This is where we pull our, our bug report Asana form is going to turn into a feature request Asana form as everybody <laughs> discovers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds pretty likely. Back to our standard cave. Well, if anybody doesn't have, if or if nobody has, Jesus Christ, if nobody has any questions, um, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. Um, my next office hours is the Friday after next, so if anybody has topics they would like me to cover, uh, blip me about them in CIP related or in DMs or something. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Benny. Bye-bye. Thank you.